Is there a relationship between, or an important relationship between race and mental capacity? If you, well, capacity is a, is a, if you mean by capacity potential, uh, then uh, who knows? Because uh, you, you, don't, you can't measure potential currently, and I suspect for the next hundred years or so probably, uh, what you can rec uh, uh, recognize and uh, measure uh, is capacity, developed capabilities. You can measure those with uh, SATs and stuff like that. But, but potential, you cannot. So when it comes to race, how does that play into the measurements that we have today? I'm not sure what, what you mean by that. Um, can you, is there a correlation between IQ, that what we have, and what we're able to measure today, and race? Oh, sure. I mean, you, there's, there's uh, and there's always been among all sorts of groups around the world. Uh, I mean, pe people in the, in the Hebrides Islands off Scotland have the same IQs as blacks in the United States, and, and probably for similar reasons, because they're, they're an isolated culture. Um, and people with ice, from isolated cultures tend not to have the same achievements as people who are in cultures that have a sort of larger culture, u cultural universe to draw, draw upon. So the data are good for measuring what is likely to happen with a given person at a given time under given circumstances. But as for the, the ultimate potential at the time, at the, at the moment of conception, no one has come close to anything like that. Broadly speaking, while in the progressive era, socioeconomic differences were attributed to race, in the liberal era, such differences were often attributed to racism. Let's take each in turn, the progressives and the liberals. The progressives, of course, dominated the first several decades of the last century. Who were they? And broadly speaking, what did they believe about race? They believed that differences in performances and outcomes between races were due to genetics. And therefore, that they, they also believed in things like eugenics. Uh, and they set the stage for what ultimately became the, the Holocaust. And why did they call themselves progressives? Or why did they come to be called progressives? Well, I guess they, they seem to think that uh, they alone were, were interested in progress. But of course, everybody uh, wants, believes in some changes. And they believe that those changes will be for the better. So uh, it, it's... It, it's hard for me to understand how they could distinguish themselves from others by that, t that term, but they believe they could, and I guess that's what matters. All right. You quote H.L. <clears throat> Mencken, whom you call a prominent intellectual during the progressive era, quote, It is apparent that the Negro, no matter how much he is educated, must remain as a race in a condition of subservience, that he must remain the inferior. Therefore, the effort to educate him has awakened in his mind ambitions and aspirations which, in the very nature of things, must go unrealized." Close quote. It's that phrase, in the very nature of things, yes. that gets to the view. Yes, th th that was a pervasive view during that era. And it is straightforward, pure racism in the strict sense of believing that the races are materially different from one another. Yes. Um, it's, 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 so, it's sort of hard to... Uh, one of, the, one of the problems with this way of thinking is that it, it eternalizes a set of circumstances that exist at the moment. Uh, and when you realize how even a whole century is just a uh, blink of an eye uh, in the history of the human race, and when you realize, for example, that uh, IQ tests have only existed for about a century and are by no means infallible, uh, you, if you look back over the centuries, and you see how the races that were on top at one time were now no longer on top. I mean, at one time, the Middle East was the leading civilization in the world. And before them, China, for even more centuries, was the leading civilization of the world. And even within Europe, uh, it was precisely the Southern Europeans who were so much more advanced than the people in Britain or Scandinavia back in the days of... Uh, uh, of uh, Greece and Rome. Or Greece and Rome. Right. Uh, uh, but what, what the people of that era did was take the different achievements of different groups uh, and sort of freeze them in stone as if there was no past and there would be no future. Uh, it's possible to dismiss Mencken. Mm. Mencken is one, one of the figures you mentioned here as a, a provocateur or a reactionary. But you note that his views were shared by John Maynard Keynes, H.G. Mm -hmm. Wells, George Bernard Shaw, Woodrow Wilson, 
leading figures, yes. looked upon even today as leading intellectuals of the first years of the 20th century, they weren't bad or malevolent mm, people. No. Talk for a moment or two, because they based, as best I can tell from, from the book, the IQ tests, they believed that they actually had objective evidence. They had proof mm. of the differences between races mm. arising from these intelligence tests that began to be given around the time of the First World War. Yes. Where did these tests come from? Well, different places, uh, some from Stanford, uh, Terman, for example. Uh, but uh, one of the people, Brigham, who, who was the author of the College Board apt Scholastic Aptitude Test, uh, made the argument that uh, these tests disproved the idea that Jews were very intelligent uh, because they scored low on the army mental test in the First World War. And now seven years later, he finally comes out and says, you know, that admits that his conclusion was without foundation because um, many of the immigrants who took that test were raised in homes where people didn't speak English. Uh, they didn't look into the data on, on blacks uh, where, who, who's... Uh, my gosh, the uh, amount of education that blacks had at that time was pathetic and the quality was even worse. Uh, so one of the ironies that I found in going through these things in detail was that if you look at the army tests, that uh, blacks did uh, much worse on very easy questions uh, that required a knowledge of words than on much more difficult questions that did not. Uh, and so, for example, the questions where uh, tell which of the following are uh, opposites. And they had things like uh, black and white, night and day, up and down. And blacks got wiped out on those tests. And the reason is that how many of them knew what the word opposite meant at that point? Right. But, well, the, but the other test, for example, required you to look at pictures of uh, stacks of blocks, including some blocks you couldn't see, but which you had to infer from the shape of the stack and count them. And blacks didn't do nearly as badly on those tests. Got it. You also note that certain cultural groups scored especially low on abstract reasoning. It's not just African Americans. It's also Gaelic speakers in the Scottish Hebrides. It's Indians in South Africa. It's working class children in rural England. It's lower class youngsters in Venezuela. Mm. It's a particular culture that is perhaps too poor to have the time, as it were, or the 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 intellectual resources to devote to abstract reasoning. I would look at it somewhat differently. You would? I would say that uh, very often we try to explain, for example, why the Irish didn't do as well as the English. Uh, and the real question is, uh, well, the real fact is that the Irish uh, were much more typical of people around the world than were the English. And the real question is, why did the English do so much better? Why was not, there an industrial re revolution on one island and not on the other? That, 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 that's right. Uh, and I, th I think the same, same thing here, that uh, if you go far enough back in history, I suspect you'll find that most of the human race had no interest in abstractions. And so the question becomes, certain kinds of cultures do oh, have, a, have a desire to get into abstractions, and that becomes an enormous advantage to them. But uh, uh, I wouldn't try to explain why the others didn't do it, because the others were, un were unfortunately what the majority of the people uh, are like in the world, even today. All right. The vitriolic controversy developing around the bell curve by Richard Herrnstein and Charles Murray has raised again questions about mental tests and their meaning. One of the charges made is that the tests are themselves unfair. But, long before the present controversy, someone replied to similar charges by pointing out, the tests are not unfair, life is unfair, and tests measure the results. The same could be said of the charge that tests are culturally biased. Life is culturally biased. We live twice as long as people in some of the poorer parts of the world not because we are more deserving, individually smarter, or otherwise more meritorious, but simply because we have the dumb luck to be born into a culture which produces cures and preventions for deadly diseases that have ravaged the human race for centuries. The cultural features which advance medical science have by no means been universal. Indeed, they have been fairly recent, as history is measured, even in the civilizations where they now exist.
Any test which tests for those kinds of features must be culturally biased, indeed should be culturally biased. There may well have been individuals born into ignorant and primitive backwaters of the world who had brain cells fully as well functioning as those of Pasteur, Salk, or other medical pioneers, but who never developed the same capabilities and never left a trace of their existence to benefit the rest of mankind. If tested by our culturally biased tests, those individuals would undoubtedly have scored low, and should have, if our purpose was the practical one of picking people actually able to do the kinds of things that needed doing in medical science. What would have happened under other cultural circumstances is a cosmic question, a question for God, perhaps, but not for intellectuals who act as if they are God. As limited human beings, we must make our choices among the alternatives actually available. A culture-free society has never been one of those alternatives. Any test designed to predict future performances in any field or in any society is trying to predict what will happen in a given cultural context. There is nothing inherently sinister about this. These are the conditions we face, or should face. Few things are discussed as unintelligently as intelligence. Seldom do those who talk or shout about this subject bother to define their terms. Is intelligence the abstract potentiality that exists at the moment of conception? The developed capabilities with which the same individual faces the world two decades later? In between, all sorts of things have happened, and happen differently for different individuals and groups. An alcoholic or drug-addicted mother begins damaging her child even before birth. Her irresponsibility, brutality, or stupidity is almost certain to do more damage to the child in the years that follow. What good would it do us to know that child's innate potential at the moment of conception? It certainly would not enable us to predict what is likely to happen now that he is what he is. Suppose that we had such a miraculous test and discovered that we started out with an Einstein and ended up with an idiot. Would that mean that the test was unfair because it showed that he was an idiot? Or would it mean that life itself was tragically unfair, not only to him, but to the whole society that now has to contend with him as he is? Maybe such a test would have some social value as a means of shocking us into a realization of what enormities result from subsidizing teenage pregnancy, for example. Yes, it would be hard on all concerned, including the public, to deny welfare to the teenager. But would it be worse than what happens because we cannot bring ourselves to deny it? Such questions could at least be asked if we had the kind of miraculous test hoped for by some but there is no sign that we are even close to developing such a test. The much-vexed question of heredity versus environment, and of possible intergroup differences in inherited potential, are better able to produce heated controversies than enlightened reasoning. Does anyone seriously doubt that heredity plays some role in some differences, or that it is seldom the whole story? The bell curve itself says, it should be no surprise to see, as one does every day, blacks functioning at high levels in every intellectually challenging field. But that did not stop the shouts of those who are in the business of shouting. Anyone who actually reads the book, which may not include all of its critics, will discover that race is not even considered in the first twelve chapters. That is hardly what the book is about, though that is what the noise is about. My own view, as a former teacher, is that most American students, of whatever background, are operating so far below their capacity that the limits of that capacity is an academic question.